All right. So today we will, we will be talking about influence driven messaging. What does that mean? That is using audience research to create effective marketing messaging. Amanda, why, why do we need good messaging? Why not just uh, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks? Hmm. No, so I, uh, <laughs> I, I might have, I might have created some slides here and uh, Amanda's going to drive as I, as I briefly explained. So my, you know, my contention, and I think the reason that this presentation is so valuable and important is that uh, we need to tell the right message for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, five in particular. So uh, you're going to have to animate these for me. Okay. Jump in. Yes, you need a message that consistently tells the right brand story. Uh, and this is because, as frustrating as it is, especially for me as a founder who sort of tells the story of the brand over and over again, is that A, it doesn't always stick the first time, and B, there are constantly new people who are being introduced to the brand, and so you are telling the story over and over. This is less true for massive brands, right? If you're Coca-Cola, almost everyone already knows the brand story, but even Coca-Cola has to tell it to new generations of consumers new markets that they enter. It's got to convey your value proposition. What is unique about what you offer and do? And uh, how does that help your potential customer, your audience? This is also this also helps you target right customers, not wrong ones. Almost every brand, even in B2B, even in the most boring, you know, I'm selling. I don't know, geological survey equipment to surveyors, it has an emotion associated with it, right? That emotion could be very straightforward or it could be quite complex, but your messaging's job is to elicit the emotion that the brand is trying to tell and to uh, associate that emotion. Potentially, for example, like with SparkToro, right? We're trying to associate the emotion of, I'm frustrated that my marketing is not working as well as it could, or that I can't pitch as well as I could to my client or customer, or that I couldn't um, do the kinds of research easily and quickly that I want to do and get the data that I need. And so that frustration is actually um, kind of the emotion that's tied to SparkToro, which is, oh, it's like this, this breath of relief that it solves the problem quickly. I think this is probably true for a lot of research tool products in software as a service. It's not, there it is. Uh, penultimately, it's got to resonate with your customer targets, right? So the message that you tell should be something that compellingly convinces the audience you are trying to target and reach that you believe will turn into customers. Uh, and that means it the, that messaging has to be using the language that they use. Amanda will talk a bunch about this. And uh, using the phrasing and style and approach that connects with how they view the problem in your solution. And last, uh, you definitely want to create appropriate expectations, meaning you don't want to sell a product or a service that is not what your product or service actually does. And this, um, I've had deep problems with this uh, all the time. In fact, even with SparkToro, I've had challenges like this where people email and say, I thought this was a sales prospecting tool and you would show me a list of all the people who match the criteria and had to explain, nope, it's an audience research tool. We anonymize and aggregate the data. And where is that perception coming from? And how do we fix that perception? Because there is nothing more powerful in messaging than creating an expectation and fulfilling it. And conversely, nothing more disappointing than creating an expectation and not fulfilling it. Right. If over the weekend, Southwest Airlines told you, hey, we're going to fly you to uh, Denver and then there was no flight to Denver. That's very disappointing. Right. Uh, so right message plus right medium, which we, we won't talk about too much in this webinar, plus great timing. Uh, equals. A high conversion rate with the right customers, and this is essentially the goal of marketing, right, to attract the right customers and right audience, and then to convert them to check out your product, service, 
nonprofit, whatever it is that you are offering. So uh, on brand positioning, right? This is on, on the where of where are we doing? This is, that was the why. The where is essentially, there's, there's a few places where you use brand messaging. This uh, almost certainly is one of the most obvious ones, right? In terms of the positioning of your brand, I, I pulled some paper boutiques. I was looking at these the other day, if you've read my blog post from, uh, from yesterday, which went to the top of Hacker News and had some, had some controversy around it. Uh, I looked at Fabriano, which of course is an Italian paper maker, and Moleskin, which um, makes the famous like Hemingway notebooks. And they have a very different marketing message in terms of and brand positioning message to sell essentially very similar products. And the way that the messaging works is to tell you that this brand and product is right for you. Hmm. This that that is an art and a science um, that Amanda will talk about in a little bit. Did you buy either of those? I own multiple notebooks from both brands. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, landing pages, this seems like an obvious one, but especially true in B2B, you are essentially writing the marketing messaging to help to, to speak the language of your customers. And my favorite way to go about this is um, learn from, from Carl Blanks and Ben Jessen at Conversion Rate Experts. I love their methodology of essentially when you are writing your landing pages, you want to use the language that your best customers use to describe your product or service and how it solves their pain points. And that's uh, how I do messaging. Product and service copy, quite similar. I think this is where a lot of that like unique value proposition has to stand out. And the, is this for me question needs to be answered. So, you know, when Asia uh, over at Demand Maven, right, makes her pitch to potential customers of her agency, right? It's how to make your next million dollars, right? So essentially early and mid stage software as a service, growth experts. She's positioning uh, what her product does and who it's for and making the, I think, relatively compelling pitch that this is about growing your sales revenue through um, the tactics and channels that she'll help you accomplish. Straightforward. I like it. Social media messaging. This is uh, taken from Nanotail, which is uh, a, a video game. And you can see that their, their social media messaging is all about um, and this is this is true in a lot of indie game spaces, right? It's about attracting new players and also fan service to people who are already playing the game and following along and potentially haven't been able to buy it yet, um, but are interested in doing so. And they're essentially speaking to the desire and also fulfilling the um, sense of almost like a serendipitous joy that comes from experiencing the product works, works quite well. Ad copy. Most of you have probably had to write <laughs> some of these. I have written a few tens of thousands in my era and uh, whether that is display ads or retargeting ads or, or social media ads or uh, Google search ads um, or copy for organic landing, uh, um, organic titles and, and snippets, this type of copy uh, is designed to communicate very quickly who it's for, what it's for, and set the expectations so that you can fulfill those on the landing page effectively. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. <laughs> All right. So, so Rand walked us through, you know, what good marketing message, what good marketing messaging is on a strategic level, you know, what it's for, how we use it. But when we get a little bit more tactical, right? So when we, you know, get to the point where we are starting to create some of this messaging, what is effective marketing messaging, right? So we, there are, um, so one way I think about it is, good marketing messaging is really at the intersection of knowing your target audience, understanding their pain points, and articulate, articulating why and how your service or product is valuable. So right in the middle there, that right there, that's, that's where the amazing messaging is. Um, some of the other elements of how to actually do this are some frameworks to consider. Um, I've been doing a lot of, you know, thinking and research on this. And I've uncovered maybe five. 
And what I've found is that um, really great messaging tends to include at least one of these elements. Um, it's specific. So when you're doing this, you know, you need to be clear who you're talking to. Better yet, make your target audience feel seen. We'll, walk, we'll go through some examples of each of these in the next slides. Um, great messaging focuses on the benefits, not the features. So show what's in it for them. Don't get too bogged down in some of the details of, of Uric of the features, but focus more on the value and outcomes and benefits. Um, great messaging is emotional. So the way I think about it is it's not even just making the customer or your target audience feel something. It's finding a way to share that feeling. I feel like um, that kind of framework will help you create, you know, great messaging that resonates. It's memorable. So be novel or clever in a way that sticks with them. And finally, sometimes, you know, great messaging defines a new category. Maybe it is done through reframing an existing solution, or it's done through creating a brand new category entirely. So some of these specific examples, specific, right? So let's look at, great, this is Ginger or Ginger.io. They are an on-demand mental health support company. So they started out as more of a B2C business, right? So you can download the app, um, speak to behavioral health coaches within seconds, talk to therapists, but they also have a B2B unit. So on their B2B unit, they're selling to employers, right? So they focus more on some of the outcomes that an employer or that a business might get when they provide this as a benefit to their employees. So the thing here with looking at specific messaging is sometimes it's really helpful to look at one brand that has both B2C and B2B units, because then you're seeing the ways in which they're presenting what is essentially the same product to two different audiences. Next, we have benefits, not features. So I think a lot of um, software as a service or software companies are really good at this. In particular, I think Zapier is really good at this, right? So Zapier helps you connect your apps and automate workflows. So they, it's sort of an integration tool to help two different apps talk to each other. Um, if you were to get into the, you know, the specific features or details as to how that works, it's a little bit hard to, to understand if somebody isn't already familiar, but the benefit is clear, automate workflows. It's easy automation for busy people. And then um, the second screenshot here is from their blog. So their blog um, is, has entirely to do with productivity, automation. Um, it goes beyond just sort of the help desk content of how to use Zapier, but there are all kinds of things like, ex like marketing tips, like what it was like to join a couple of Slack groups. Um, and they've basically doubled down on productivity across a number of industries. And so it's applicable to kind of anybody who is, you know, really into understanding how they can optimize their workflow. Next, uh, emotional. So Lego had a great campaign on get girls ready for the world. So this campaign focused on, you know, helping helping young girls um, better understand creative or be better hone their creative skills, learn how to build things, um, set them up for a successful future. It was a campaign that really tapped into our emotions, but it was also a really, uh, it was also really easy to get behind this cause, right? Like everybody wants young, you know, girls, children to be successful. So this was a great example of that. And then, also Nike, Nike does a great job with the way that they kind of evolve their just do it campaign, um, the way they keep it fresh. Um, in particular, last year they had the You Can't Stop Us campaign, which was kind of a natural extension of just do it. Um, but here they also tapped into some of the, this campaign came out, you know, last summer um, when political tensions were running high. So I think, you know, some people found this polarizing but um, it was ultimately a successful campaign. It drove you know, impressions. It, it helped grow their business, brought in money. Um, but it was, it was something that really stuck with a lot of people. And I think it won a bunch of awards too. Memorable. So 
Um, emotional or well, memorable content or memorable, memorable messaging doesn't always have to be emotional, right? So what is memorable? Um, I was thinking about some of my favorite, some of my favorite consumer brands or direct to consumer brands. And one of them is uh, a hemp based adaptogen drink called recess. Their messaging is very distinct and it kind of, it permeates across their entire customer experience. So on Instagram, they had this kind of funny post. It was strawberry rose or strawberry rose mood is the resident Ted Lasso fan at recess. She's a real inspiration. They have some kind of funny, quirky uh, messaging like this. And they've also really doubled down on the all lowercase, which I think is interesting. Um, this, this second shot here, this came from, this is a screenshot from an order confirmation. Um, it says, Hi, Amanda. Thanks to the miraculous power of technology, we have received the order that you placed only moments ago. How this is possible is wildly beyond my comprehension as a mere copywriter, but here we are, face-to-face, -face, so to speak, inside the confines of an automated email. Two lost souls searching for something intangible in an incomprehensible world. Anyway, your order should, should ship soon. So this, is, this, I thought, was really funny, endearing. Definitely memorable. Um, the lowercase thing makes me think that it's a human being. That's crazy. Yeah, it's very, it's very personable, right? And it's, it's very self, it's self-aware, self-referential. It says as a mere copywriter, mm -hmm. so it acknowledges, hey, we, you know, a copywriter wrote this. Um, yeah, so yeah. clever. And then, out of curiosity, I signed up for their affiliate program because I don't know. Even then, all the, the all lowercase. So this was. So this is their affiliate program. So it says, we're so glad you decided to join Peach Ginger's publicity team, colloquially known as our affiliate program. We believe you have what it takes to do for Peach Ginger, what Kris Jenner did for Kim Kardashian. <laughs> so do it work. Yeah. I know. I think I know who Kim Kardashian is, but I don't know mm. what Kris Jenner is. Um, they're just, there's some family. Some people know who they are. Okay. Some people keep up with them, I think. Okay. <laughs> Wait, I got that reference. I am <laughs> old, but not that old. But right, so this is a good example of something that it's not necessarily emotional, right? But it's it's memorable. It's very unique to them. It's kind of edgy and it's fun. Um, and then finally, here we have defines a category. So there are some really good examples of this, like Marketo. So Marketo. Um, you know, they're a marketing automation software. And I don't know if a lot of people know this at this point because we've come so far in marketing automation, but um, at, Mar Marketo was um, the first company to really popularize this phrase. They may have coined this phrase even, but they're known for this. Um, another example, Gong. So Gong does um, a sort of, they sell a sort of AI software that integrates with sales calls to help you get to help you get better insights into you know why maybe your deals aren't closing stuff like that but they've called this revenue intelligence that's the coin phrase that they that they created um, as they kind of have created this new category and then finally us spread Coro. so <laughs> i think you know who we are i hope so um so we've kind of doubled down on this messaging of audience research um it's not quite market research, although it's similar, um, but this is research on your intended audience. Um, so we now uh, we've been we've been doing this audience research newsletter. Um, you can sign up. We'll find We'll find a link somewhere. <laughs> um, but we decided yeah, to just call this. <laughs> we decided to just call this the audience research newsletter, right? Not not the SparkToro newsletter, but audience research to basically help people do great audience research um, with or without SparkToro. Um, yeah. Hopefully you will use our tool, but yeah. I have a favorite story about this, Amanda. So, um, you know, our friend Will Reynolds over at Sear, he uh, years ago was, was talking about how he was pitching Mercedes Benz for their SEO campaign. This is, you know, mm -hmm. for, for search engine optimization. And he was like, you guys, you, you've you got to get a used cars page. Like you don't have any pages targeting used cars on your whole website. It's ridiculous. And uh, the VP he was pitching said, Will, we're not going to do it. 
like Mercedes Benz is not going to put up a used cars page. Uh, we have decided that we're investing in creating a new category, pre-owned vehicles. And this was this was like 2002 or 2003 or whatever. And Will thought this was the dumbest thing in the world. There's no search volume for pre-owned vehicles, right? There's millions of searches for used cars. Turns out Mercedes-Benz building this category worked like a charm. It was basic, It was like that messaging definition of a new category that made people who are interested in luxury vehicles use luxury vehicles, like shift their mindset around it. And I... Um, it stuck with me ever since. Like, I just, I love that example. Wow. That's Obviously B2C, but yeah. Yeah. No, that's incredible. I didn't know that. I didn't know that they like invented that phrasing. Yeah. We should see if we could get them on to, uh, to talk about it sometimes. Yeah. Great. That would be cool. All right. So what do I have? Okay. So we've talked about all these frameworks, you know, why you need great messaging, oh, an overview of kind of how to do it. So how can we really get in there and how can we really create this messaging? Um, I think it's, Wait, what's my next one? All right. So here, here, here's what I have. So I think it's good to learn from the brands that you already know and love, right? Like that's kind of what I did with the recess drink example. Um, but what I think is what is usually more helpful is to look at some of the highly competitive brands or highly competitive spaces, especially when there isn't a ton of differentiation. Um, some easy starting points might be in B2B services. SaaS and customer and consumer products. So let's start with B2B services. Um, like an agency, there are a lot of marketing agencies, a lot of content marketing agencies. Um, if you're not familiar with the space, it might seem like they're all the same, right? But I think, you know, just, just the same way that all people can be different, all agencies can be different too. It's just um, it's sort of up to them to figure out the messaging that really resonates with people that best communicates their offering. So our friends over at Siege Media, they kind of have this, uh, when I look more closely at some of their messaging, I saw there's a little bit of the us versus them narrative. Um, they do content creation, they do digital PR. So their messaging, this is from their homepage. Other firms waste your time and budget guessing at which content will get traction with your audience and stick in results not us. We are a content marketing agency that tears through search data to find lucrative ranking opportunities we know you can capture. Then we create content your competitors can't match with coverage they can only envy. It's SEO focused, customer centric content, and it's hugely effective. So very clear about the outcomes that they provide, how they're different, why you should choose them. I've, I've heard um, April Dunford talk a bunch about like in any sector where the problem space is well understood, positioning yourself in opposition to what else is out there is a really, really good idea. Yeah. Our friends over at Foundation. Um, so I've noticed their content kind of, it tends to go a little bit beyond SEO. Uh, they have a focus on research and data and content distribution. So from their website, we have, we create, and we create and distribute content your audience will love. We combine qualitative and quantitative data to better understand competitive landscapes, brand opportunities, content trends, and growth channels for B2B brands. So, I mean, maybe they may or may not consider themselves a content marketing agency at this point, but I think this messaging does a good job of communicating that value of content that goes beyond SEO. Yeah. And then finally, this is my old stopping grounds, Growth Machine. Uh, Growth Machine is more of a boutique agency where it's more of like if you wanted someone to run your blog for you. Um, so they focus on keyword research, writing the actual content, and link building. So from their website, uh, our core it, it just dives into what the core offerings are. Search-focused content marketing. So planning, the keyword research part, writing, um, they have a huge writer database where even if you just wanted to um, tap into hiring one of their freelance writers, you could do that. Um, they do optimization. So they make sure they do an, a, a sort of audit to make sure each content kind of passes the test and is up to standards. And then they also do link building. This is all just on their homepage. 
very upfront about what they do. Uh, now let's look at some SaaS companies, Google, Calendly, and Savvy Cal. So these are all pretty similar offerings. Um, I don't know if Calendly considers Doodle a competitor, but they do very similar things. They do, they help people schedule meetings. So for Doodle, um, Doodle has been around for years, right? I mean, more than five years. Um, they are sort of the category leader and they call themselves a scheduling service. So Doodle, from their Twitter bio, it says Doodle, the leading online scheduling service from their homepage. Meetings made simple. Save time scheduling your day with the power of Doodle. Uh, what does Calendly do? Calendly focuses more on the ease of use and they call themselves modern scheduling. So from their Twitter bio, it says Calendly is modern scheduling that makes finding time a breeze. And then from their website, easy scheduling ahead. Calendly is your hub for scheduling meetings professionally and efficiently. So this is sort of interesting that they uh, have stayed away from words like tool, software, um, and they've really just tried to, uh, on their Twitter bio especially, it just says Calendly is modern scheduling. So that is I, Yeah, I really feel like there's this difference between we're for be like we're for businesses and professionals versus like we're for everybody mm -hmm. and calendly is seems very clearly going after the like oh you're a whatever fiction writer who's busy like we're we're for you as well as vp of account marketing you know at, at a software company yeah and that's interesting because then i now i was looking at savvy cal savvy cal seems more a it's like it's like savvy cal um is for people who are maybe more mature in the space of scheduling tools because they their messaging is more around user satisfaction um mm. and they've they're just you know they've just used scheduling tool finally a scheduling tool both the sender and the recipient will love i feel like they're very aware of this whole like i don't like calendly links or, or scheduling links um and they focus on the overall, like, no, you'll love it, right? On their homepage, it says, finally, a scheduling tool both you and your recipients will love. So, yeah. There it is. You'll love it for the advanced features to keep you in control of your calendar. They'll love it for the personalized scheduling experience. All right. And so, finally, my last example here is in uh, consumer businesses. Uh, mattress companies. This is a really good example of, you know, a category where there's a ton of competition. It's basically the same thing, but a lot of the leading brands have figured out how to differentiate their messaging and they speak to very different kinds of um, consumer needs or pain points. So let's look at Tuft and Needle first. Um, I was looking at their website and was seeing that they've kind of doubled down on being the best across multiple categories of like overall quality, decent pricing. They do a bunch of bundles um, and focus on sleep itself. So, I mean, there's a ton of match messaging on their site, but this, this one kind of seems to embody most of it. Our new bedding bundles make it easy to get guests ready. So this speaks to, you know, all this copy here speaks to general value, but not, you know, not like, high discount, right? Saving, ten, saving is 15. That a, is that a play on like the holidays are upcoming? And so we're guessing that you will soon have guests. And so we're, we're like pitching a problem we think that people are thinking about. I think so, but it doesn't say holiday on their website, right? At least not when I looked at it a couple of days ago, but yeah, I think, yeah. yes, I think this is a good way to kind of tap into um, some seasonal needs without necessarily saying, hey, holiday season's coming up, right? Because right. we all know that. <laughs> but yeah, so focused on like bundles, having guests, um, having multiple products. Another good example here is Nectar. So Nectar is, you know, they, I mean, looking at their website, they're very much a discount brand, right? So $499 special offer, um, $100 off and accessories included. Our biggest offer ever. Um, details what's included, says it's extremely high demand, don't miss out. So a lot of this is focused on discounts, 
FOMO, um, get the best deal, that kind of thing. And there's Casper. Casper, this one was a little bit tougher, I think, for me to figure out specifically what they were talking to because they have a lot of messaging for a lot of things. But what I think they are focused on is features. So modern mattresses designed with everyone in mind. Better restful sleep, no matter your preferences. So I think this is a little bit of trying to talk to everybody, but trying to talk to everybody in the sense that we have different kinds of things that fulfill everyone's needs. I think they also do bundles as well. And then finally, avocado. Um, they are focused on, you know, natural and organic. Go natural, certified organic mattresses with a one year sleep trial. Uh, and so all their messaging is very much focused on like their materials, you know, being organic, that kind of thing. So, and, and I should also say that I think most of these other brands like Casper and Tuft & Needle, I think they also have organic mattresses too. So it's interesting that Avocado is sort of like, uh, they're, they're focused on really just that organic part. All right, so if you don't know your audience well, can you create messaging based on their sources of influence? So this is kind of hopefully cutting to the meat of why we're all here. If you can identify some of the sources of influence, can you create messaging based on that? I hope so. This is what I did when I worked at Fitbit. Um, this is a, just a very manual example of finding sources of influence. Um, when I worked at Fitbit on the B2B team, we sold devices in bulk and software to HR and benefits leaders. Um, this was not an audience I knew much about, but I learned through a survey that they read Psychology Today and Entrepreneur. So to me, this told me that they see themselves as mini CEOs of their department. They are in the business of people and they care about inspiring change. So the messaging that I came up with uh, that we really focused on for a while was, hey, they're overachiever, right? We didn't want to say like, hi, HR director or like, hey, benefits leader. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know that anybody really wants to be called, hey, job title, right? Um, but I think overachiever was something that it resonated very deeply with them because they self-identified as that too, even whether or not they said it. Um, they And also because like HR and benefits leaders tend to have a lot of different interests too. Um, and when we focused on this kind of messaging of them being overachievers and calling them overachievers, uh, we got great response to it. Um, we even had a couple of emails that went out that people replied to it to say, I love that you called me this. This is totally how I see myself. I thank you so much for this. Um, and this kind of shaped the way that we created content for the rest of the year. Cause then we were focused on like, how can we help these overachievers um, meet their business goals? Um, and so we created white papers on helping to drive or inspire change. We had um, conferences with keynote sessions from people like Amy Cuddy, um, the, a known TED speaker and I think Columbia professor. Um, so yes, yeah, so this kind of helped to really elevate the, our messaging and the kinds of content we were trying to create. So can you do this with SparkToro? We really hope so. <laughs> we hope, maybe. Um, I had some fun with this because I kind of wanted to treat this like uh, as an exercise in how can I use SparkToro to try to brainstorm at least some initial, mess some initial messaging. So the fake example that I came up with for myself was coffee. So I decided to pretend, like, let's say I was trying to create, uh, you know, like a high end or like a nice subscription based coffee brand, like a d nice coffee D to C brand. Uh, so we what... have we have a couple of subscribers here. I've been helping the angler coffee folks with exactly oh, cool. this. So there you go. Oh, cool. All right. Um, maybe they're here. Maybe they're. <laughs> yeah, could, could be. <laughs> uh, so what I did here was this is a screenshot from the SparkToro dashboard. Um, I tried a query that kind of spoke to the high end type of audience. I think this query was from, uh, typing in my audience frequently talks about fair trade coffee. Um, my light hypothesis being that 
maybe, you know, there's an audience of coffee drinkers that really cares about making sure their beans are fair trade. Um, so these are the social accounts they follow the most. And then some of the high engagement hidden gems. I was overall looking at this like, okay, this is my, this is my sort of starting point. I'm going to start, I'm going to do a couple of queries to see what kinds of patterns I can uncover. So the things that jump out to me here are, you know, Roast Magazine, Barista Magazine, Sweet Maria's Coffee, um, Daily Coffee News, Spredge.com. All right. So I'm going to do a couple more searches. So the next search I tried was, okay, then I was thinking, I, and I, I'm an avid coffee drinker and I have strong opinions about how I like my coffee. Um, so I decided to look at the different kinds of coffee preparation methods. Um, one popular way to, to brew coffee is through a, a, a device called a Chemex. Um, it looks kind of like a, a beaker that you'd see in a science lab. Um, so, okay. So SparkToro's database has found over 2000 people that talk about Chemex. Um, and I'm, I'm always interested in what the text insights in SparkToro say. So the top words in bios, specialty, roaster, husband, best specialty coffee. Um, that's interesting. And top hashtags were espresso, latte art, frequently used phrases, Costa Rica, French press. Okay. This is interesting. Um, I dug deeper in the uh, top words and bios. So there were things like roaster, husband, best, specialty coffee, father. Hmm, that's interesting. So I tried another search term, AeroPress. This is personally how I like my coffee. I make it through an AeroPress. Um, our database found over 2,000 people that talk about AeroPress. So there's a pattern here, right? A lot of these words are really similar. Um, the only one that looks distinct to me is under frequently used phrases. There's AeroPress Championship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look that up later because I wonder what that is. Um, but we're seeing husband again. So I'm like, hmm, maybe there are a lot of men who really like Chemex and AeroPress. Yeah, there are. <laughs> <laughs> like every software engineer I've ever worked with is yeah. basically is obsessed with those two. <laughs> um. So then I try to search for a burr grinder. So uh, a burr grinder is, you know, it's a little countertop machine that grinds coffee beans and you can choose the grind size on this. Um, this is a smaller search, right? Only 600, 671 people will talk about burr grinder, but look, there's more. Best, husband, professional, roaster. Um, really interesting. So then I mean, I, roaster suggests to me that you've got a big uh, pro audience that's talking about it, right? Yeah. I'm in the professional coffee world as yeah. opposed to like a amateur at home maker of coffee. Totally. Yeah. So then I started thinking, okay, like there are definitely some patterns here. There are some social accounts in my spark Toro searches that I'm going to look up some podcasts, YouTube channels. These are all things I'm going to do some research on. And then maybe this will help guide a way that I might create some of my messaging. So what am I seeing here? I'm seeing a lot of self-identifiers. Dad, husband, roaster, espresso, enthusiast, coffee lover, coffee addict. Hmm. Next, I found a podcast, Sweet Maria's Coffee. This kept coming up as one of the top influential podcasts. Um, so I checked it out and it seemed like a very pleasant podcast. Each episode was like 20 minutes or so, which was nice. Uh, and I saw one in particular, really nice find. They had an episode called Personal Brewing Routines and the Weirdness of Coffee Culture. This seems very niche. And I really like that because I, that personally, you know, helps me figure out how I can kind of talk to this audience. And then finally, a very popular website that came up was Sprudge.com. Very, very clearly for coffee lovers. Um, I checked out the website. I saw there's a good focus on like local coffee cultures design, like designs of like burlap bags that hold uh, large quantities of beans. Who knew there was a content opportunity for that? Um, and coffee shop recommendations. So, you know, this, I thought, okay, this gives me, I think, a good starting point into how I might create some messaging. And so for fun, I decided, like, what are some messaging things I might consider? And by no means is this like a very strong recommendation for me. I mean, this could be terrible, right? This is the first draft of messaging. 
So maybe, you know, on the landing page, I would want something like we roast and ship, you grind and hand pour. Maybe, right? It's kind of direct. It speaks to the different kinds of coffee methods. Hmm. Maybe there's a campaign that we do, right? Like an email marketing thing. It's slow down for a change between school drop off and board meetings. Aren't you tired of the grind? I don't know. Maybe that's silly and like kind of, you know, ridiculous to say are tired of the grind, but maybe it would resonate. I would test this messaging. Um, and then finally, maybe we have kind of an aspirational top line sort of tagline. Productivity shouldn't be a grind. So maybe this speaks to the sort of high performer type of audience. This speaks to the notion of wanting to be really productive after you drink a couple cups of coffee. Maybe this would work. Maybe. So I'll take I'll turn it back over to Rand because I know he has some great advice on B2B messaging. Oh yeah. So I I like the methodology that you've described here, Amanda. And I know obviously, you know, we've seen, I think we we sort of learn from our customers in a lot of ways, right? We've seen a bunch of agencies and consultants and you know, in-house marketers like use this this data to form their messaging and also to do like um uh, brand research and audience research. But in B2B, what I like about um, what SparkToro lets me do is that in a space that I don't understand well, for example, um, Wiz here is in this sort of cloud security field, which I was helping someone with the other day. Um, and I do not have a lot of experience in cloud security. You know, technically we did some stuff like back at Moz and obviously Casey does a bunch of stuff for us at SparkToro, but it's just not my world, right? It's kind of over my head technically, but but you can get this like deep sense of what conversations and topics are popular over the last kind of quarter, right? Because Bartoro's data is essentially from the last about 120 days. So you get this sense of, oh, okay, people who have cloud security in their bio or people who use clouds, who talk about cloud security online, talk about Azure and Kubernetes and hybrid cloud and private cloud and disaster recovery. And then you go over to like the messaging of some of these places like, like Wiz, right? And you find those same words and phrases like, oh, okay, everybody knows, everybody in cloud security knows AWS, Azure, GCP, and Kubernetes. And you get this sense of like, aha, the language that people use in one place is the same language that you want to reflect and make resonant in your messaging on your website. What I what I worry about is when you, as an agency or a consultant or a marketer, um, exclusively use search data to populate this because there are often terms and phrases, content, context, um, topics that don't get searched for but do get discussed. And that that's sort of like, you know, it's it's like the missing half of keyword research is where I feel like SparkToro is is really useful. And obviously, you could use other um, you know social listening tools for this as well, um, or or uh, social media monitoring tools, right? If you were set up a specific alert for a sector, but it's nice to be able to do it for any given sector at any time and get this data. I'm also really excited because I think uh, Casey's next project is working on trending this over time. And that I think will be killer too. Awesome. That's what we have for now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we have got a ton of Q&A. So, oh, awesome. That um, is. Let me try.